one we are live this is 2of entertainment welcome to the lost dollar business club where we talk about business 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 and not just business we talk about what makes businesses go up and what makes businesses go down if you're interested in businesses this is where it is we talk about the global economy we talk about global politics we talk about everything and anything business related that affects your life on a global scale as well as a local scale and don't miss after the show lost and found hey this All right. Is okay. Various guests and members. We actually have a guest today. We do have a guest today. <laughs> it's one of our favorites. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely one of our favorites. We have Mike Collins, the author yeah. of the book Dismantling the American Dream How Multinational Corporations Undermine American Prosperity. And he's got decades of experience in manufacturing. He writes articles all the time. We keep getting them. Yeah. And we are happy to have him back on the show to talk about. Today, China's most favored nation status. And John's favorite country is China. So this should be a really interesting show for us today. So. I'm looking forward to it. So should we bring Mr. Michael in? I think yeah. so. You're ready to roll. Michael, there you go, Michael. It's all Hello, you now. guys. How are you doing? How are you yes, doing? this is a fascinating subject. And let me begin as, by setting the stage with an, a statement. The original rationalization for allowing China into the WTO was that it would move China to become more democratic country with an open market. The policymakers assumed that working interdependently with China would bring greater stability because both countries would be more dependent on each other's fortunes China would then become a cooperative and more honest trading partner and a reasonable competitor. But it simply did not happen. Let me let me throw the question back at you guys. Why did we do this? Why didn't we do it? Well, so th so tell us a little bit, first of all, most favored nation status in brief after they've been in that status for 23 years. But what is that for our, our listeners? What is that? Yeah, what does it do for them? Most, well, the, first of all, China was allowed into the WTO that at the same time. Is the world giving, organization, right? But yes, but giving uh, uh, a country most favored nation status means they get to equally uh, compete in the U.S. and other markets, and it moves them in, in the Commerce Department rules in the column one, uh, they moved them from column two, which is a 39% tariff for all non FMFN companies, to column one, which is almost a zero tariff. So it takes away the tariffs and the restrictions and allows them to enter our markets and compete with us like all American companies. That's, well, that's changed. That's changed because we're doing something with somebody from China and they're importing something. And I think their tariff was 75%. So they have no more MFN. And if they do, it's just on paper only. So. Well, the, the administration has put a, has added tariffs to the, and they've kept the section 301 Trump tariffs, but Biden has added a bunch of new ones too. So they're gradually getting there and eroding down the most favored nation status. Right. Now, let me follow up with it. Is China, when they got most favored nation, they came up with a plan called Made in China 2025. Mm -hmm. And it's a 10-year plan where they publicly said what industries and what technologies they want. And... And there are things like information technology, electric vehicles, robotics. They're coming after the battery, the solar cell, the semiconductor, biomedicine, uh, wind turbines, and on and on. And they they publicly say that they're, they want to be the world leader in advanced technology manufacturing 
by acquiring new technologies any way they can, legally yeah. or illegally. Yeah, tell us, tell us. Get them that. dominance of, of an industry. I take the, I've read this plan many times, and basically what they're saying is, we're coming at you. Here's what we're after. Can you stop us? That's, right. that's, that's what it, that's where we are. But you, yeah, the, in, in that document, you're saying it was just clearly stated in 2015 what their strategic plan and goal were, uh, was, and it's to go after all of that. And each, the, the significant well, thing, they've spelled out exactly which industries they want and how to get the technologies to penetrate them. Then they, th their strategy is called predatory mercantilism. And let me explain some of the things it means. When they got in and got the most favored nation, the first thing they did was they came up with this idea for technology transfer. So if you want, if you're a major U.S. corporation, you want to build a plant in China to go to their middle class, you had to get a joint venture agreement with a Chinese company. Well, this was a, and, and we did, it, we ran over there and did it, but this was a really big deal because it was a way that China, through their um, joint venture uh, companies, gained the technology, how to manufacture it, and all the technology secrets, and we're still doing it. So, so we fell right into the trap and, and helped them. And the big thing is they get the technology eventually and the products and they don't have to do any research and development to do it. So it was a real blessing for them. The other primary uh, part of this, their manufacturing plan, it's based on state-owned enter enterprises. And this is a big deal. The China has 91 state-owned enterprise corporations that are Fortune 500 size or bigger. 91. They have eight. They have a degree of ownership in 867,000 other companies in China. The SOEs are 60% of China's market capitalization is something like $70 trillion. They are 28% of their GDP. The state-owned enterprises are the primary weapons they use to go after the technology and the industries. So it's a big, it's a big deal. And they, and the second part of it is, well, Mike, Mike, what, what, uh, what, what somebody might say, well, what evidence do we have that they're actually doing this? Is this, is this, I mean, we, we know that it's there, but what can you cite that says that this has been actually been done? Well, I'm going to go through the, the various strategies they're using. And as we go through, it'll show where they, where they are. The first part of that is they get subsidies. And for example, in the EV industries to crack the worldwide electric vehicle market, that industry in China, those SOEs got $140 billion in subsidies between 2009 and, and 2020. And another one that I follow carefully is the wind turbine industry. China uh, has made a big effort at trying to get grab a hold of this. They have been number three in the world behind GE, which is two, and Vestas from Europe, which has been number one for a long time. I looked at the figures, and in 2023, uh, their, their big turbine manufacturer is called Goldwyn, and they're now tied for number one for Vestas. Mm -hmm. So they're doing it. Uh, they get, if you're a, a wind turbine manufacturer in China, you get 40 different types of subsidy programs. Um, there, there was an, an example of how they do it. In 2019, there was a GE employee in New York called Zay Zhang. 
He was indicted for on charges of economic espionage and conspiracy to steal GE trade secrets in Turbine Technologies. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened to him, but the trade trade secrets are in China. They've got them, and now they're they're tied for number one. So subsidies and state-owned enterprises are the, kind of the tip of the spear for where we're going after these industries. The uh, Another big strategy they use is dumping and overcapacity. You see this in the news all the time. Um, they Dumping is, is overproducing products in China and then dumping them into a market that they're after at below cost in, in the market. It's illegal, but they do it. Chairman Z says there is no so-called problem of overcapacity, but the, the Commerce Department has proven with data that they have uh, over, they have dumped and done over overcapacity in steel autos and solar panels. For sure, they have the, so they do it, you know, and they apologize and go back and have a lot of meetings, but then they continue to do it. And, the, and, and the penalty, by the way, that the, the Chinese individual you mentioned uh, got two years of, uh, of, of sentencing. Of time, really? And only one year was on probation. So he Not barely got years. on the list. Two whole years. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Well, let me, Michael, before you continue, let me just say a couple things. There's a book called China 2050 that was written by their military, which takes 2025 and actually extrapolates it even more. Um, I've read the 20, I've read the 2050 book. Um, fascinating read if you can get it. So I would recommend if you're into what you think China's going to do, read that book, and that will give you even a more concise picture of where they are and what they want to do. The other thing China said yesterday it was in the FT is for the EV market, with all these tariffs going on, especially the EU, they were like, we're not going to write checks anymore. Like, we're not going to be partners with BMW or Volkswagen Group or whoever it may be. Um, so they're feeling the pinch from all the, um, the tariffs, whether it's from the EU or whether it's from the United States. So now they're starting to threat, their threat is to hold their money back. Um, so that's going to be interesting to see how that is going to go forward since a lot of these companies are relying on Chinese money to advance their technology. Yeah, that, that will be interesting. And I will get that book. I want to get you the title at the end of it again. Sure. Okay. Another, besides dumping and overcapacity, another strategy that is part of this mercantilism is what they've done now with uh, the section 301 tariffs to get around the tariffs and get around even Biden's latest tariffs, they transship into other countries. A good example is when they, they're, at, they're close to 80% of the world's solar market. And we're struggling here to, you know, to keep ours together. So they, they went and built plants in Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, and Cambodia, and they ship solar panels through them. I, we all know it, but there'd been very little effort in Congress to try to stop them. Sure. The, the other thing that they do, it, it, since they can't ship raw, raw steel is a 232 tariff and it's 25%. So they backed away from that. So what they do is they send raw steel to other countries around the world, like the United Arab Emirates, Thailand, Vietnam, and Oman. They buy the raw steel, make it into pipes and and products, and ship it into the United States. And to Steve's point about the EVs, they're right now building a number of plants in Mexico. Yep. They're, that's B Y. That's B Y D. Yeah, BYD. they're they're so they're and 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 they're part of the Mexico is just has just overwhelmed us and broken the NAFTA accord they signed with the conduit and all kinds of pipe steel now. It's an, so we've got another problem with Mexico. 
But Michael, let me ask you this. A lot of the issues when we talk about um, MFN and cheap labor and cheap this and cheap that, if we go back and look at this back, not in the 60s, but the 70s and 80s when it started more in the, I guess, in the 80s and the early 90s, that's really America's problem because America priced itself A, out of a market internally. And also it was like, oh, cheap is better. Cheap is better. Cheap is better. Let's outsource. Let's outsource. And nobody had the forethought like the Chinese, if you will, to write a book that goes out 50 or 100 years and go, what's going to happen 30, 40, 50 years from now? Because Americans, and I know we're all Americans here, um, are stupid for the most part. We think about what's going to happen in three hours. The Asians think about what's going to happen in a thousand years. So it's no fault. It's more our fault, not their fault, that they actually became smarter well, if you want to say trickier, because I know John loves China. I mean, however you want to look at it, they played the game well. And we're going to punish them now for the game well. Now, I know in Australia with the wine business, you know, they they blackmailed them. Like, we're not going to buy any more of your wine until you do this with us. Well, <laughs> so you, when you have economic power, you can do what you want. But our problem as a country is we are lazy. We don't want to do anything. We don't want to build anything. We just want give me, give me, give me. All these other countries are like, fine, we'll give you. So I, I know what the issues are. But really, our government has to start like getting out of its own way then and saying, OK, then we need to bring stuff back. But we don't do that. So and I mean, this kind of tongue in cheek. Kudos to China. You game the system and you're doing it well. I mean, whether it's B BYD having plants all over the world so you can bring cars to the United States, whether it's the solar, the wind, they gamed it. And we supposedly the greatest country on the planet. We're not gaming the system that well. We're going, you're bad. Stop it. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we're bad. We'll stop it. Meanwhile, they're still doing it. And now UAE, same thing. All these other countries are gaming the system while the United States is still stuck in, I don't know, 1860. And that's a bad yeah. thing. Well, uh, let me answer that by, by backing up and saying part of it is the capitalism of our giant companies that I wrote in great detail and in the book dismantling they went when the opportunity presented itself in the 70s and 80s they went for outsourcing because it was short term quarterly profits mm -hmm. and the and the and I've written many times about the fact that it's a short term policy and in doing that and going and making stuff in China they're giving away their industries and they're giving away their technologies. This is the corporations that are doing this for short term. I don't know the answer to that and how you can get uh, companies like Caterpillar or GE to uh, ignore the short term investor pressures and look at the long term and what's best for the country. It's, but they don't because all the, and here's what the problem comes into one bonuses are tied to what you did That's yesterday. Right. right? right. And so until we go back into where we think about, and I don't want to, I'm not trying to be like a, a communist here. So everybody send your cards and letters to David, because I won't read them. We, until you go, our country comes first and then the company comes second. So we become a strong country again. Everything, whether you're Democrat or Republic, all these things that you're doing, you're not really doing anything. You're making it tough for the like the middle class and everybody under to survive. You're not doing anything to better the country. You're bettering, you're bettering big business, and that's cool until there's a civil war, and then you're going to be like, oh, we should have thought about this. So once again, China's not doing any better because what they've done now is they're stifling their startups because their startups can't do a lot of stuff because of the way the government has changed over in the last three years. So startups there are less. They have problems when they come to the United States. Less. You're right. Dramatically. Yes, it's huge. 90%, 90 it, a, plummet. Right? Because there's an article yesterday in the FT about this. So huge. They're having a problem when they go on exchanges outside of China because when they have to get their books audited, you can't audit fiction. So really, all these governments, it's great that they're playing this game of risk. But for the normal person, that's whether you're a billionaire or you're a guy who makes 200000 a year or something in between or less, it's not helping you. And, and the governments don't seem to care. The CEOs, all they care about is, am I going to get my $35 million bonus? At some point, that runs out. 
And, and until we think differently, we're screwed. I mean, globally, we're screwed, not just our country. And the countries that are gaming the system, as much as we'd like to fault them, I can't fault them for gaming a system that we set up. Well, you, you, you're sorry. absolutely right. And in, in fact, that's the, if, if I was to write another book, it would be right. that. Is there a way to put country first? You know, right. that's, that's the issue. Politically, I don't know what will happen. I do know that th what we have done for the last 40 years, particularly in outsourcing, manufacturing, losing 7 million jobs and all that, has created uh, not only inequality, but a real bad unrest in the middle class. And you see politically it, it coming up now. People are angry. They're worried about their futures and so on. And they've got good reason to be, but it's created political problems now. I, I think that that states the long-term, what can you do to change U.S. corporations to be long-term thinkers? Yeah, I don't know. Good yeah. luck. No, I think, like, you know, John. I think, you know, to that problem, it, I, you know, we have, I, I, we got into this philosophy that CEOs and management and everybody needs to get a bonus. Now mm -hmm. we have to eliminate the bonus out of the system. No more shares, no more nothing. You do a job, we'll pay you. Right? The reward system is 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 flawed, completely flawed, because you know it, it favors you know the a very few at the top of of the management of, of companies. You know the the lower part. You know let's just call it two thirds of the of the workforce in any enterprise does not make a lot of money, right? And and the incentive is 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 for you know as you say short term profits so that uh, you know you meet the this, the short term goals for your payout as a bonus uh, and shares and I, I think you know if we if we take that reward system you know we don't even need to have you know too much government uh, regulation over that then you know then performance is is a little bit more aligned with with the long term future of a company now. Uh, you know this this you know if companies had actually real leadership instead of just financial engineering jockeys with excel then you know we'd have a whole different picture you know when you look at family enterprises that are that that, that think long term they're still making a lot of money uh but you know they're they're not throwing they're not committing suicide by doing you know short-term strategy by as you as you as we all know, giving the technology to the the person that's going to compete with you, and has the resources to compete with you long term. So I think if we change the reward system and mm. you know eliminate all this this this, you're going to get rich because you're you know a CEO or your management and you get shares. I think just uh, it would help a lot. It's not a total solution, but it's a partial solution. Absolutely, John, it would help a lot. But you know, from everything you just said, Milton Friedman is turning over in his grave. Yeah. That's yeah. totally a contradiction to the Milton Friedman thing, which is the religion they all went for in the 70s when they put together the business roundtable. That was it. It was shareholder value. You know, written up, you know, in stone, shareholder value first, period, and everything else is academic. That's yeah. where we, we turn. So, but as we, you point out, you know, look at it, uh, you know, in the 1900, early 1900s, US steel was, you know, the number one biggest producer of steel. Right? They didn't invest in their company, they went for, you know, whatever the strategy was. Now they're you know, I think they're in the top 50, maybe, right? Uh, Nippon Steel, yeah. I think, is the number one, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And they're trying to buy everybody on the planet. Including Bauer, U.S. No, Steel. No, yeah. no, Bauer Steel is the number one oh, okay. steel company in the world. They, you know, as Mike has pointed out, they put out produce, you know, the top 15 companies. They are the biggest, you know, steel dumpers in the world, right? Right. Uh, so, he, but they gained yes. the system, though. Once again, it's cool. yes, Listen, yes. U.S. Steel, U.S. Steel could be the number one steel company in the world, um, and they could sell to Dubai and sell all and what and the same thing. It's just that, to everyone's point, it's the CEO is like, okay, I'm going to cut all these costs. I'm going to outsource it, and look at how much money we're making. You're not really making anything. You're just resellers. 
So if you if you don't start thinking about long term, learn Mandarin because in twenty twenty in twenty one hundred uh, you'll be speaking it, and nobody's got grasping that. Where China has said we're going to take over the world by twenty fifty, and they're just gaming a system that we have set up. And we're not seeing it. And the politicians, when they debate and when they do all the other crap, they don't talk about it. You know, and it's like at some point you're going to have to address this elephant in the room or the dragon in the room or the tiger in the room, whatever you want to go with there. That's the first one. Then you've got to look at India, which no one's looking at. Right. It's only India. And and they're following China's plan as well. So at some point, we, you know, what are well, we going to do? We're going to sit here and, and do nothing. At the end of the story, you know, we're just bringing down everybody's standard of living down right. to the lowest common denominator. Right? That's right. Uh, we call it regression to the mean. To the mean. Yeah. yeah. Regression and, to the mean. Well, you know, you look at who are the big players in this, and and one of the strongest players is Wall Street. Wall Street is now – Wall welcome. Street firms like BlackRock and Vanguard that have – like eight or 10 billion each in terms of total assets. I mean, trillion, they, trillion. They are investing in Chinese companies. They're mm -hmm. taking, they're taking money from pensions and from people's savings and putting these Chinese stocks into their mutual funds. Mm -hmm. So they, they get away with it because they're taking our money and they're putting it through Chinese stock exchanges, so it's out of the country, so it's legal uh, to do, but it's uh, but it's really helping the SOEs and the people mm -hmm. who need. So we are funding, and many of these Chinese companies are on the entity list because of the Uyghur situation or other rules they've broken. They're on the entity list, and they can't compete in the United States, but we. We, uh, we're feeding them with our money, our investors, particularly retail investor money. So what do you think about that? Is there a way to stop Wall Street from? Doing uh, Michael, this? You, you know, I think the best line in any movie ever was when Michael Douglas played his, his Gordon Gecko and he said, greed is good. And unfortunately, with all the woke and all this other political crap and all the other BS, the end of the day, at the heart of it, someone's figuring they give a dollar and they're going to make ten thousand dollars back. It's all about greed, and they don't care about anything other than they have more than their neighbor. So, no, unfortunately, nothing's going to happen. It doesn't matter which idiot gets into the White House, what morons are in the Senate or the Congress. Nothing's going to happen because greed is good, and that's it. And it's Mike, not changing ever. Mike, why don't you tell us though about the Select Committee? that yeah, recently yeah. published the Reset, Prevent, Build, a strategy to win America's economic competition with the I'm, Chinese. I'm government. getting to it, but let me, let me do two more things before sure. we get down to that, because that's a summary. The, uh, the one thing I'd like to say is espionage. Right. The, the public just doesn't realize how, how much uh, China devotes to espionage. FBI Director Ray Kun goes to the uh, Senate and can, and every year and, and does a hearing, he said, the last time he was up, there is no country that presents a broader, more severe threat to our innovation, our ideas, and our economic security than China does. FBI is opening a new China-related counterintelligence investigation on the average every 12 hours. They have now 2,000 cases currently underway over espionage. The Chinese argument has tried to, the, the Chinese government uses espionage to steal intellectual property and technology and research. And they've done it for, for every major industry we have and every major technology. So we're behind the curve on this, and the FBI knows, you know, how bad this is. But, but they've been very successful in in doing it, and they see it as just a strategy for their made in China plan. 
Uh, Doing so, business so, in America. So uh, another question before we get to this, the committee is, will negotiation work? And if you want to read a really good book about uh, negotiation with China, it's R Robert Lighthizer's book, No Trade is Free. He goes into great detail in what it was like to deal with them over issue by issue. And basically what they do is we, we tell them all the problems and all the ways they're cheating and ask them to stop and they come back and they, they nod their head and say that they're, they're going to reform and they're not going to do that anymore. And then the next thing we know, they do it. So negotiation with them has been an exercise in futility. It, you just can't do it with the Chinese communist uh, influence. Um, right, Lighthizer said, I don't know if tariffs, tariffs alone will get them to stop cheating. I know one thing that won't work is talking to them. Yeah. So, so it's, um, it's given me a, a, a new take I don't think that we can beat them at this game because they play by their own rules and they've been very successful. And if we keep, as Stephen says, doing what we're doing, we're going to lose the, the big game. Now, there's a, there's a House Select Committee on Strategic Competition between the U.S. and the Chinese Communist Party. They, they've had many hearings, but they issued a report called Reset, Prevent, Build, a strategy to win America's economic uh, competition with the Chinese. There's a lot in this report, but it gets down to, uh, at the bottom, they come right out and say that the, the giving most favored nation status to China was a big mistake. That was a big admission. It was wrong to do it. And so their recommendation is to revoke most favored nation status. And if they did that, the one thing that Chinese really do understand is money and the tariffs and losing uh, from a monetary point of view. If they, if they revoke them, they're automatically over on the column two, which is there starts, it's as average 39% tariffs on everything, everything. Yeah. So there's, we've got $300 billion tariff, but there's another 250, 275 billion that is, that is not tariffed. So it's, now, do, I think we have a big advantage if we were re ready to go, go this route and do it. And that's, we have the largest consumer economy in the world. Everybody wants a part of it. Chinese, China is dedicated to their big share of it. And China's economy depends exclusively on exports. They, they don't allow many imports. So their growth is pretty much, a, a, as most of you probably know, China's got some, their own internal financial problems they have a the the economy isn't that sound and i think that i think the only thing they're export they're importing is tesla because um, musk made a huge deal there for the ev company so i know tesla is very big in in china i mean that's the only thing they they can do but yeah they're having a problem with shadow banking they're having a problem with uh their gdp because that for a while was tied to how many apartments you can build so their construction businesses are going out their banks are going out so they're having big issues um and i don't think they thought through that either um but still they control the purse strings like we said earlier when the eu was like we're going to put tariffs on byd and everybody else you're like oh well then we just won't give you the 140 billion dollars you need to build more evs so they do hold the purse strings for a lot of companies that start all of a sudden pounding their chest to their governments going, we need their money, instead of saying, how do we do it internally? And that's what the issue is, right? To everyone's point from earlier, and to John's point, you know, I, I have to make my quarterly numbers or I don't keep my job as the CEO or the CFO or the COO or this or that. And until we start thinking differently, it, it won't change.
You yeah. know, they'll they'll just game it. They'll just think a, a new way to play the game, and that's what this we, is gonna in a year from now. We have to change, you know, and accept and say, okay, we tried it one strategy. We wanted them to get into the WTO, most favored nation. It didn't work. They're not becoming a democracy any in any any of our lifetimes. Right? Let's admit that. Right. And yes, we're going to have to pay the price for our follies. And if our products that are made locally or within the Western, you know, civilized world are more expensive, well, then we're going to have to eat that. But at least let's pay it internally, right? Because it will be re redistributed within our own borders and not getting it to the damn Chinese, right? Who are going to steal, bribe, you know, cajole and, you know, infiltrate everywhere. There's tons, you know, all these, you know, there's tons of spies in the U.S. We know that, that Rye knows that, right? We have to go after them, deport them. You know, it's just war. We have to declare war on them. It, it is war. It's a new Cold War. Yeah. And and we're losing. And say, so I think you guys think the same way. We're not going to win the game as it's played right now. Yeah, we we're, gonna, the we're not going to. You just can't, you know, the Biden and the administration aren't coming up with enough uh, tariffs fast enough to, to deal with them. I want to say that. that it, it's not even it, the Democrats or the Republicans. Neither of them are coming up with enough. They do enough to get someone to go, we should vote for you. But they don't really think through. Like I said, they, today's Monday. I think of enough to get on to Friday and they don't think past Friday. So they're not saying, what do I need for a good 10 or 20 year plan? So we can actually get back in the game. And they're not doing that. They're just saying, today's Monday. I need a plan for Tuesday and Wednesday we'll worry about. That's not, that's not good politics. That's not even good to run a business. But that's how we seem to run things. And that's, about, well, and that's bad. We need to change in, our uh, politics. Let me end this by saying that I was in, a, in August, the House uh, has many committees that are dealing with China's people problems and they declared one of the weeks was be China week where all the committees would deal with issues like from the Communist Party uh, issues like the de minimis uh, problem where fentanyl is coming in uh, and a whole race there's a, there's five or six committees they voted that but that these the problems these committees are facing were eight of 10 in terms of importance. But when they were asked again, what were the chances of the committees doing something about them? They, they said two in 10. So <laughs> what happened is at the end of China week, the Republican chairman of the committees tabled all the committee uh, efforts. They tabled it. They decided they would not vote on any of these things. Now, why is, you know, is that because of the upcoming election politics? I don't know. I do know that the people lobbying against all these committees were U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the, uh, the uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese Solar Panel League, and and then other people who, here who don't want to make progress on these are are USPS, right. FedEx, Amazon, you know, and 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 all the people who are making a lot of money from imports. Yeah. And, and this is there's a lot of lobbying money being tossed around, uh, so it's it, it's difficult, but. I was very hopeful that they could reach some, you know, they yeah. could put the stuff to a floor vote and they wouldn't do it. So you got to so go follow where, the money. Right? That's, yep. you that's follow where the money. we are right yeah. now. If you follow that's the money, we, you know who the traders are, right? Yeah. Who, who just think about their own selfish greed. And we need to, you know, we, you know, the thing is we have a, a sleepy, you know, uh, uh, population that doesn't see what's in front of them and doesn't vote these these useless guys out and puts people that are thinking the way we need them to think right. uh, but unfortunately that's a that's a 
you know, so it has to be a grassroots at the local level. And, and, you know, I don't think we have that. It's just, just very, it's difficult. That requires Americans to think, and they don't do that anymore. They don't read, they don't think if it's not a 30 second TikTok, Instagram, whatever, they don't, it's not, if, you know, they have, no one watches Bloomberg, people watch us, the same people that watch us watch Bloomberg. Right. So if you're not really into what's going on and you're just happy that you make your money and you can pay your bills and you have a car, you can go on a holiday with your family, nobody cares. But no one looks at the bigger picture. And by the time America wakes up for the bigger picture, it will be 2050 and it will be too late. And that's it. And that's what the problem is. I'd say we're at a tipping point right now. We don't have to wait for 2050. You know, oh, we're there just, now. I agree yeah. with you 100. percent That's what I'm saying. It's too, until we can game the system for our favor, we're sol. Yeah. Well, and, here's and a, here's an idea. Is sure. one thing that works on Congress is a big change in public opinion, mm-hmm. and we know that there are things that can change them. For instance, when Russia invaded Ukraine, right. boom, Congress went immediately and revoked most favored nation status from it. So, you know, it, so big events like that will work. Yeah. They will change people's minds and right. public opinion can change Congress. So what well, is it China gonna invading be? Taiwan? China invading Taiwan would change public opinion. Yes. There was an article in FT or the Wall Street Journal the other day that was saying, Taiwan was saying, with all their war games they're doing, by the time America realizes that they've attacked us, it'll be too late. <sighs> so... There's there's no positives on the on the horizon yeah. except of course we at the lizard people the Illuminati Association want to thank the Americans because we just get rich every day but for everybody else they're kind of SOL and and it'll be too late by the time it's done you know the yeah, the billionaires I mean, will become trillionaires and that's it and mm-hmm. unless there's a civil war nothing's going to happen and I don't care who gets in the White House or wins in November unless they grow a pair of balls and I mean quickly nothing's going to happen for the next. Mm-hmm eight, four, pick your amount of years because every, no one wants to ruffle a feather. They're all afraid. Mm-hmm. No one's putting country first. They're all putting themselves, their company, but blah, blah, blah. when people go, I'm an American, I'm like, really, are you? You were born an American, but are you an American? You know, back in the day in the thirties, forties and fifties, when you said you were an American, that actually meant something when you said it, when you say it today, it just means you were born in America. And I know there's a handful of people out there that they say they're an American and they mean it. Most people, when they say they're an American, they don't mean squat. And mm-hmm. that's part of the other issue. There's, we have no country. We have no patriotism. You know, that's what yeah, I know. That's what do I know? Yeah. And flying uh, over a football stadium in a stealth bomber is, does not make you an American. The first step is always awareness of the, the problem. And then now we got to solve it. Yeah. I agree. Yep. I agree. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike, for bringing this up. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is big. This could be a big step forward, revoking that status and, and getting revoke people. that status. Yeah, oh, Michael, the next time you're on, we're going to do the show live, so people can actually ask questions while we do it. That's right. Well, that's a good idea. Good there idea. Go. So yeah. yeah. So let's try to have you back sooner than later. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Mike. I've enjoyed it, guys. Thank you very Always much. Good to see you, Michael. Cheers. Oh, take care. Bye bye. All right, let's do this really quick. All right. Get the freedom and the flexibility of remote work in the lucrative tech industry. Bend your life around, around the world. Bendicoot is the premier course and community for thriving in a remote tech career. Join the revolution today. Bendicoot.com, official partner of the Lost Dollar Business Club. I mean, I know that company's selling out to China, so you know we got to promote them. Anyway, um, yeah. so- <laughs> oh god, no way, <laughs> no yeah. way, no. no. So that I love when he's on. We should have him on like once a month or every other yeah. month, every six weeks. Yeah. And, and no, the awareness we- is important. This is critical. Yeah. This is crisis. We'll have it live though next time, and because yeah, next week the shows go are going to be live and rebroadcasted on Saturday. But I think when he comes on, even though his show we record much later in the afternoon on a Tuesday. Yeah. We should do it live for people that are going to like be like, I want to be part of the conversation. Um, yeah. I think that could be a fun show. Yeah, a fun can, show. Look, uh, yeah. Sometimes, you know, little things, you know, in Germany, they stopped uh, the incentives to buy EVs. Yeah. EVs, EV sales dropped 69%, no, it's 89% 
lower. I mean, so, you know. You Thank God, do- someone's using their brain. Yeah. 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 Crap out of those yes. things. Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I think my, zero, I care a waste. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I hate to tell you. <laughs> my, uh, you want to know mine today? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Oh, we're gonna yes. do all right. right now, hold on. Yeah. Lost and found. Oh, yes, lost and found. All right. Hold Ever on. wonder how millions vanish into thin air, or how a single dollar can make all the difference? Join us on Lost and Found, where we dive into the wild world of financial mysteries, from misplaced fortunes to unexpected windfalls. We unravel the stories of people, companies, organizations, and even governments who've lost and found millions. Lost and found because every dollar has a story. All right, John. John. All right, John. What's your story? Okay, so, you know, th- there is sanity sometimes, you know, when I think government doesn't interfere. So right. the owner of Three Mile Island, Constellation Energy, yeah. right? Yeah. And going to invest 1.6 billion and it's going to restart unit one of the nuclear uh, plant. And it okay. should yeah, it should come online by 2028. Right. Okay. And it's going to sell the entirety of its most of its uh, output to Microsoft to to power uh, data uh, AI data centers. Uh, and Microsoft has already it, it spent this year fifty billion dollars on on this and it's planning to spend another fifty billion. So, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, I'm all for the whole nuclear uh, revival. So here's, I think here's a I'm good. I'm looking for Pennsylvania to glow and glow at night. I'm liking that. That's going to be awesome. This yeah. Way we can find them. So, so I think it's, a, I think, I think it's, I don't know. I think it's a dollar gained all around. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Very cool. And we'll, get, and we'll get better. You know, we'll get the AI from Microsoft. Yeah. I uh, know you'll get it from somewhere else. Hey, I from yeah. Microsoft. They don't have AI. <laughs> so, well, there's here. Let me give you two really quick, and then Michael will let you. will do. First one is, um, we talked about this before the show. BlackRock and AI are going to start looking how to make better chips that'll save the planet, energy storage, blah blah blah. But they're looking in all the wrong places. Good luck, guys. If you need that companies, there's small companies out there that are making them that you have no clue about because you're too stupid to read stuff they send you, um, and you can't get your head out of your asses. So good luck with BlackRock and Microsoft. The other thing, and that's a win or a loss, depending on how you look at it. The other thing is um, the Japanese baseball player for the Los Angeles Dodgers uh, made MLB history the other night when he had um, 50 hits and 50 home runs. Um, So I thought that was amazing. So congratulations. I can't pronounce his name. I'm not even going to try. So congratulations to him. He's making people want to watch baseball again and wow. kudos to you so that is a dollar win from uh, for mlb so there you congratulations go. yeah so very cool and my nets never never gonna win <laughs> <laughs> well we'll end on it we'll end on an ai note uh okay. AI is also predicting elections oh so god there's a seven person company called aru a-a-r-u oh. yeah yeah led by two 19-year-old college dropouts in Manhattan. Of course and, they, and they, they correctly predicted uh, one of the New York Democratic primaries in June okay. within 371 votes. Nice. Pretty good. Yeah. That is amazing. It's amazing. Wait, wait, so so who, what are they, they, who do they say is going to win the public the presidential election on November 6th or 4th or whatever day it's going to be on? Well, it, well, the thing is it keeps changing because they're constantly, because it's so affordable to do it, yeah. They can draw on 5,000 AI respondents. So they've created okay. 5,000 AI bots that are supposed yeah. to represent the public. Yeah. And they, and they uh, interpret the news. Those 5,000 bots interpret the news, interpret what happens, and right. then tells them uh, how they're voting. Okay. So, so as of today, or as of, as as of today, <laughs> as of today Kamala, Kamala is ahead. Yeah. Uh-huh. So even though there's a bot that says that Mickey Mouse is the preferred bet. Well, can I tell you, um, I am voting for Mickey. Uh-huh. That's where I'm going to vote for Mickey because he is my number one choice every year. Um, every year, that's right. Every year. He's my number one choice because our government runs like Mickey Mouse. Oh, boy. So, yeah. So yeah. that is uh, it's true. That's it's true. But, but it, that's, that, was, that was a good show with Michael. Yeah, he, got, he has to come well, back no. more because I think this is – and he's in the know. And for the and people yes. that don't know, we're we're Michael emails us 
um, and I mean this with love, a book at least once or twice a month. And when I mean a book, he writes out his thoughts and it is a book. It's like if you read his book that Michael talked about a little while ago, we get one of those every two weeks that we can read. Um, and it's fascinating. So I read it and then it's a bunch of other famous authors and economists in that email chain and they all respond. So when you start reading all the responses, it's like you have this brain trust and it's fascinating to me. True. Um, True. And it's, I'm very, I'm, I feel very fortunate that I'm on that. I'm little old me is in this list of these, this brain trust. And I know you guys are on it and I'm just like, Oh, this is cool. And I enjoy reading it. it. I'll Eh, we don't like. Uh, um, I'll add you. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a part of that lane trust, you know. Can't say brain. How are you going to do part of the lane trust? So I will on the lane trust. Oh you boy, know, it's the Argentinian Nazi gold thing. But we'll get you on the list. Don't worry, John. I'll. I'll... Yeah, let's do it. Okay, yeah, I'm trying to save you guys, but. <laughs> you are. John, you are. He's trying to save us. So everybody, this All was right. great. Now next Friday, if you're listening on the podcast. Uh, we're sorry. We're not doing it live on the podcast because we're not a radio. You'll have the Saturday morning show. If you are watching us on YouTube next Saturday at um, 830 a.m. New York City time or EST for you people that are left handed, we will be live. Um, oh, you're going to be. Can, no, we'll be live on Friday. 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 Yeah, that's right. The Friday. It, it, that's what I said. It, it's no, Friday it's in the morning. That's Friday the twenty seventh. We'll be live Friday. We'll be live on Friday mornings with a with a rebroadcast. John drinks a lot. Um, with a rebroadcast on Saturday, so you'll be able to join the show, ask questions. Um, and if you would like to be a guest on the show, and and you're like Mr. Collins, you are more than welcome to reach out to us, and we'll put you on. But going forward, our shows are going to be live because we have a lot of people saying, but we want to ask all these questions while you're talking. So we're going to let them start doing that. So we figured that'll be kind of a fun show to do as well. And there you go. Very interesting. John? Yep. This was good. Yep. (laughs) John's like, yep, I'm done. He's like, it's Friday. (laughs) So guys, it's always good to see you. To all our fan, thank you very much. I think David's back in another week or so. Um, yeah. Don't forget, if you're listening on the podcast or want to watch uh, or listen on the podcast, Two Old Farts Making Noises, wherever you get your podcast, look for Lost Dollar Business Club. If not, we'll see you here on YouTube next week, live and a rebroadcast on Saturday. Everybody, have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you all soon. Cheers. Ciao. Sure.